Well, good evening. Welcome to another Spirit Light broadcast. I'm Pastor Ken. We're so glad that you joined in with us this Wednesday evening. Come on, let's say Romans 8 and 2 together. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you and I free from the law of sin and death. You know, spirit life is imperative to walking. Jesus said in John 6, 63, he said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Amen. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead in the precious Holy Ghost is on the inside of us. Amen. And when we take the engrafted word of God and put it on our lips, amen, and hide it in our hearts, amen, the, the power of God begins to manifest. Amen. Faith is voice activated. And when we release the word of God, amen, verbally, the spirit life of the kingdom of God begins to move on our situation. Amen. Spirit life, abundant life, Zoe life, the God kind of life. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I came to give you life, amen, in abundance to the full until it overflows, amen. God wants you and I to live, amen. He wants us to live long. He wants us to live strong. But most of all, he wants us to live in agreement with his holy and precious word. So we take communion every time we meet. It is the meal that heals. Amen. Jesus said that his body was broken, that ours might be mended. Amen. And the blood was shed that you and I could be uh, sons and daughters of the Most High God. And so we thank God for the broken body of Jesus Christ. Isaiah said it this way. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, that he was bruised for our iniquities. It says that the, the chastisement that you and I should have suffered came on him, and with his stripes we are healed. Peter says we were healed, and so we understand Isaiah is looking towards the cross. Peter's looking back at the cross. But either way, thank God, the stripes of Jesus and the arm of the Lord belongs to the believer tonight. I don't know what sickness, what disease, what ailment, what situation is trying to paralyze you. But you've heard me say this before, and I'll say this till Jesus comes. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is incurable. The devil is a liar, and he'll try to come against your mind to make you feel like you're stuck and that there's no way out for you, but there's nothing impossible, and there's nothing incurable. You've got the word of God, amen, and you're able to overcome anything that ails you. So tonight, we thank God for the body of Jesus in the bread for the blood that represents the cup, and you are gloriously healed tonight. Amen. God ordained it that by the stripes of Jesus, you and I will be able to take up our bed and walk. So I speak of you tonight, the healing virtue power of Jesus Christ coming into your situation and consuming every area of lack, barrenness, scarceness, infirmity, sickness, and disease, fear, whatever the situation would be, let God arise tonight and your enemy be scattered. Let's pray together.
The writer said, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Then he went on to say, oh, precious is the flow that makes us white as snow. No other felt I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. The blood of Jesus has given us a right to call Almighty God our Heavenly Father. Our Father, Daddy God, we have a right to call his name because of the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. We've been looking in the uh, the word of God and the, uh, the benefits of unity and how when we are unified as a people of God, when we are unified, uh, many times even supernatural things begin to transpire when we are unified and walking in the will of God pertaining to unity. First Peter 3 and 8, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be merciful, be courteous. I'm going to read that again. The, the Apostle Peter is uh, he's ex exhorting the church here at Cappadocia, and he says, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, Love as brethren. Uh, one translation says, uh, be pitiful, but means having pity, uh, having mercy, uh, and uh, be courteous. And then it says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. And he says, only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So the apostle Paul says, I want to hear about you, uh, being one, I want to hear about you striving together uh, for the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. We need unity uh, everywhere we go. We, of course, we need unity in our homes. We need unity uh, in our churches. You know, we need unity uh, in the marketplace. We said that uh, God ordained unity, uh, he ordained order, and he started it uh, after he uh, kept looking down and seeing the chaos that was in the earth. You understand when, uh, when he cast out Lucifer and, and those other angels, and the word of God says that uh, when they were cast out, Isaiah said it this way. He said he saw Lucifer falling from heaven uh, like a, a meteorite, like a, a like a falling star, like a like a, a flash of lightning. Boom! It just he just was evicted out of glory, and uh, the third of the angels with him. And it wasn't long after they had fallen. Uh, from their, their, their place of glory. Uh, of course, they were totally, they went from uh, a glorious place to a place of total degradation and darkness. And it wasn't long until the word of God is very clear in Genesis 1 that the earth was void and uh, without form Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then God said, I'm not looking at that any longer. And he said, let there be light. Amen. And we decree and declare, 
light tonight. Light in our homes, light in our church, light in various ministries, amen? Light in the marketplace. And you and I are the people of light. We take the light. We take the unity. We take the blessing. We take the power of God, the healing power of God to these places, amen, and we cause the change. I'm going to read Genesis chapter 1 because we, we do want to get the understanding that God brought unity and order out of chaos. He brought unity and order out of chaos, and this we know it's God's will. Whenever we see a lack of unity, whenever we see chaos, whenever we see a lack of order, you know what? We don't really need to point the fingers. We need to get busy. You know, we used to do experiments in, in college. I was in the uh, behavioral science field. and They said that even children uh, that uh, were uh, mentally impaired could tell uh, if there was a loving disposition, if there was an acceptance disposition coming towards them. You know, you don't have to be rocket science to know that someone cares, someone wants to bring order, someone wants to bring unity without condemnation, you know, without uh, bringing about a whole bunch of uh, skepticism, pessimism, you know, criticism, you know, it's, 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 it's easy to find fault, amen, but God wants us to be able to come in and bring unity, amen, and peace and order into the situations of life, especially in our families, in our church, in our ministries, and in the place that he wants uh, to glorify himself in. And so uh, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So we understand God doesn't make anything uh, uh, without form and void and dark. We know God doesn't, he doesn't, uh, that's not his way. Uh, Lucifer was evicted with a third of the angels. And of course, they got down here and they just, you know, they just tore things up. And God got tired of looking at it. And it says that the spirit of God was moving. He was hoovering. He was just brewing over the waters, waiting to take the command of God. And when God said, let there be light, there was light, and a new manifestation came into the earth, amen, and God began to make things all over again. Uh, he began to uh, bring about his uh, restoration program, his uh, rehabilitation program in the earth. Amen. And um, if you read through Genesis, the first couple chapters, you'll see that God said it was good. Amen. It was all good. And so I said that to say that God wants us to have uh, unity uh, in ministry, in our churches, in our homes. Amen. And it's a, a work that needs to be uh, we need to be aware of because the enemy is always trying to sow strife and discord and provoke the people of God to anger. Now, it says in Psalms 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He says, It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirt of his garments. And as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, 
For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So we said that unity many times brings a supernatural benefit. It says the Lord commanded the blessing. The people of God got the anointing of unity. And uh, the word of God says it, it, it was like the, the oil that came down. Aaron's head, down his beard, down his holy garments, even to the ground. You know, with the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost is exalted. Amen. Whether it's, it's in our immediate families or, or in the church or uh, in the marketplace on our jobs, there is going to be a commanded blessing. God loves unity. God loves order. God loves his people walking together in the under the anointing of divine unity. And so uh, the place of unity begins to provoke the commanded blessing. The place of unity provokes the commanded blessing. So many times we're praying about things way too long. We need to get an agreement with someone. Amen. Of course, the first thing we need to do is we need to get an agreement with God. Amen. You know, so many times the enemy uses uh, situations and circumstances uh, to bring about an ambiguity wherein we don't even know what the will of God is. You know, things get so confusing. You know, he, he, he uh, misrepresents. He, he uh, uses uh, the, the tongues and the, uh, the waggings of others uh, who are full of pessimism and, and skepticism. You know, uh, he uses uh, uh, people uh, to bring about a disorder you know, and nowadays, so many times, uh, the spirit of offense is abounding. And the spirit of offense abounds is because many people don't even get in the word of God. You know, many Christians are not in the word of God. So, of course, the spirit of offense begins to abound because the word of God is very clear. There's a peace that comes with abiding in the word. And then uh, it says in Psalm 119, a perfect peace have they that are in love with the word of God and nothing shall offend them. Woo! <laughs> I tell you, yeah. David said he got himself in the word of God. He got his heart right. He got his mind right. And he couldn't be offended. Praise God. Amen. It'd be a wonderful thing if we couldn't be offended. Amen. I think we need to uh, really begin to uh, get in the word of God. Amen. Because things are getting more and more chaotic. And we know with chaos, you know, comes devils. All, you know, the devil thrives in, in uh, gossips and he thrives in unforgiveness and he, he thrives in hate and he, he thrives in discord. He thrives in, in chaos. Amen. And so we don't want uh, these doctrines of devils uh, manifesting, you know, in the midst when all we have to do is give ourselves over to the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Amen. Preferring one another. Amen. Blessing each other. Amen. And choosing to walk in agreement. Amen. Even when we don't see eye to eye. You know, I want to give out some vocabulary here. You know, one of the definitions of oneness when we're talking about the corporate anointing is everyone working together in unity. You know, when you're talking about your home, when you're talking about the church or, or parachurch ministries, you know, when you're talking about a, a oneness there, you're talking about everyone working together in unity. And uh, we said unity 
Unity is the place of consistent commitment to purpose. Unity is the place of consistent commitment to purpose. You know, many times the enemy will use things to uh, get us off of the commitment to the purpose. What was the original purpose? What did God call us to do? And so unity is the place of consistent commitment to purpose. Then we have what we call uh, agreement. The acknowledgement, uh, agree, to agree is to acknowledge the opinion of another uh, even if I don't fully agree, even if I'm reluctant about it, I acknowledge the opinion of another. You know, uh, Amos 3.3 3 says, how can two walk together unless they be in agreement? That doesn't mean I go along with everything you said, but I have, uh, I acknowledge the opinion of the other person and um, even if I, I'm really not uh, big on it, amen? And then we have uh, accord, accord, a course of action taken by two. A course, it says that they were on one accord, amen? Uh, and they were of one mind, and they were in one place. And when, when, when the, uh, the church received the power of the Spirit, amen, they were of one accord, one mind, one place, the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace. Can you imagine uh, the things that took place that the Bible really doesn't go into uh, when you're talking about the day of Pentecost? How many healings? You know, how many people just had their lives changed as the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace was exalted and God was pleased and he poured out his spirit on the church. And so we said that the benefits of unity, number one, it brings uh, uh, the commanded blessing on the sin. Uh, number two, the, the, the benefits of unity, according to Matthew 18, 19, the power of God moves into situations to help us. Amen? The power of God moves into situations to help us. Matthew 18, Matthew 18 and 19. Very familiar scriptures. Very familiar scriptures. We have looked at these scriptures over and over again, and it says, again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. And so uh, the power of God moves into uh, our situations to help us. Number three, we're talking about the benefits of unity. According to Ephesians 4.11, the strengthening and increase of productivity. It strengthens us and it increases our productivity. When we are unified, there is a greater productivity and there is a greater strength that takes place where we are. It says, uh, let's, go, let's go back here. Um, in verse uh, Philippians 4, 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. And then it talks about verse 11, and he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so we said that unity will bring about a strengthening, amen, in the midst of us and an increase of productivity. Then we said, number four, that unity uh, brings about a undeniable testimony that will impact the world. You know, when we are unified as the people of God, the people of, when we are unified as people of God, the world will see us different. They'll see Jesus different. Uh, Jesus said in John 17, beginning with verse uh, 21, he says, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are. Jesus said, when we are unified as the people of God, the world will even see. It will be an undeniable testimony, amen, to the world that we belong to God, amen, and that we are the people of purpose. We are the people of God, amen, and he has called us to a wonderful calling of being unified in the spirit and bound in peace. You know, the place of agreement is the place of power. The place of agreement is the place of power. No wonder the enemy is always trying to bring about a, a lack of unity, you know, in our midst because it weakens the power that we have as believers. And uh, we understand Satan provokes strife uh, to defeat the saints. I want to close with James, James chapter 3. Satan provokes strife to weaken the saints. Isn't it interesting how, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you this, and I know this from experience. The more you spend time in the word of God, the less you'll be offended. The less you spend time in the word of God, the more offense will just be able to it's, It will almost clothe you. Amen. But the more you spend time in the word of God, the less you can be offended. So it is very, uh, very clear that when people walk around in long-term offense, uh, they've not given themselves over to the word of God. Let's close with James chapter 3. It says, Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, but, it, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. See, that's why uh, the enemy wants to bring a lack of unity. It not only breaks the power, but it, 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 usher, it, it ushers in all other types of demonic activity. And it says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Amen. You know, we want to be peaceful people. We want to be unified people. Amen. We want our homes to be full of unity. Amen. We want our children to know unity. Amen. We want our churches to be full of unity. Amen. And so let's uh, begin 
to give ourselves over to the unity of the spirit and to the bond of peace. Amen. Let us be unified. Amen. And, uh, you know, if you don't want it to happen to you, don't say it about someone else. <laughs> you know, uh, I heard a preacher say years ago, if you don't want it, don't say it. Amen. If you don't want it to happen to you, don't say it's going to happen to someone else. Amen. You know, God's called us to unity. Amen. God hates chaos. That's why uh, he gave this world another chance. Amen. He evicted Lucifer and those fallen angels. And one day he just couldn't take it anymore. And he said, no longer will it be dark. No longer will it be without form and void. And he said, I'm going to create it again. I'm going to do it again. Amen. God loves unity. He loves you and I. Amen. And so let's start working on. Amen. The unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Put away everything that's antagonistic, strifeful. Amen. Let, it, let us get our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. This is Pastor Ken saying, Lord bless you, continue to keep you safe, and have a wonderful Wednesday evening.